click to go live and then I'll can hit go live. All right, and we are live. Hello everyone. Welcome to another small shadow recession. Today we are so excited to have Dr. Deshaun with us, who is a prosthodontics resident at UIC. To everyone watching, thank you and be sure to leave any questions you have in the chat box. And with that being said, thank you so much, Dr. Deshaun, for being here and you can take it away when you are ready. Thank you for having me and thanks for everyone who's tuning in this late afternoon to learn more about dentistry. So my name is Samantha Deshaun and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. So I'm gonna go over a quick overview about my life journey and then I'm gonna share uh, what made me want to become a dentist and later on I become a dental specialist in prosthodontics. So I was born in Gallup in New Mexico and then when I was three years old, I moved to Middle East and I settled in uh, the capital of Jordan, Amman, and I lived almost like 14 years over there. And then my family and I decided to come back to the state and then we settled down in Chicago. And here I finished my high school and college and university. And then I moved to California for four years for dental school. So I enrolled at Western University of Health Sciences and I spent four years over there and then I moved back to Chicago. And I actually did my, started my dental training in one of the specialties in dentistry, which is prosthodontics. And now um, during this summer, July of 2021, I'm moving to Boston for two years to start my implantology fellowship in Harvard. So the question is, how did I decide to become a dentist? So that actually happened during high school. Um, I remember I went to one of the dental offices in the neighborhood where I lived at, and I just liked the dental office, the dentist, the dentist, the dental team, and how everything is running around in a smooth way. And I was like, this is a great career maybe to consider. And around the same time, um, I had a project in the high school to actually do like a research and PowerPoint about the career that I want to be in. So I actually learned more about dentistry. And every time I read anything, I'm just like, more interested uh, to know more. And it kind of like took my attention and I didn't want to be anything else but, a, but just a dentist. And again, I'm the first dentist in the family. So it's a little bit hard because there's no one around me to learn from or to ask any question I have. So it was really like a solo homework to gather information and to know more and to learn more before I actually consider to be a dentist. So after high school, I get enrolled in a community college for two years. And at the end of the second year of my community college, I started shadowing in the same dental office uh, for almost six months because I used to be a full-time student and I used to go there on Saturdays. So it took me like six months to collect around 200 uh, shadowing hours that I needed for my dental application. And after that, I secured a dental assistant position um, in the same dental office. And at the, around that time, I also transferred to University of Illinois at Chicago to uh, continue my education and get my bachelor. So this is UIC. Um, I graduated from UIC in 2013 with a bachelor in biological sciences. Um, at the end of this year too, in my senior year, I took the DAT exam, um, which prepared me to start applying to the application. Yet, because I took it kind of toward the end of my senior year, that made me have a gap year between the university and the dental school. And as I said in the slide, I tried to maintain a good GPA because it does help you in the application uh, to have a good GPA, um, especially because it's a competitive uh, process and everyone, like a lot of people are applying. So you want to stand out by having uh, like uh, everything good in your application, GPA, volunteering experience and all that. So what did I do during my gap year? Um, I become a full-time, um, I had a full-time job in the same dental office, uh, which made me get exposed to a lot of um, experience, learn more, I also did some front desk tasks, um, some management. So I, 
I try, I started to feel like I'm learning more also about the management and the administration in dentistry, not only the dental procedures. Around the same time, I started to prepare my idea at SAS application. And this is the application that you will be applying through. Uh, and everything is going to be sent to the dental schools uh, through this application. I also started to gather my letter of recommendation and I tried to volunteer in the community through the dental office by doing oral hygiene and doing like dental education in, in like in some elementary um, schools. And I also started to prepare for some dental um, school interviews. So for the dental school interviews, like how do you usually do it or how do you think about it? How do you approach it? So usually you try to have um, a really good application that's gonna be starting to be sent out to dental schools and they're gonna start uh, approaching you and sending you an invitation. So by the time you get your invitation, I would just tell you that you kind of made it. So you're more than halfway there. So just be proud about it and start um, teaching yourself how to enjoy the process. Because the minute that you start to enjoy the process, it means that you're gonna be more of yourself than you just trying to um, be someone else. So just like be yourself, show the bright side of your personality. Um, also, before you go to the dental interview, you can always search what possible questions can be on the dent during the dental interviews and try to like prepare for them, um, write your unique answers, practice them. This is not a bad idea. And then at the end of the slide, I wrote like, I usually don't ask questions, but you can, you can ask questions. But usually by the time I get to the program, I almost know everything about the program. And you really wanna know, show them that you know everything and you're excited to be there rather than you're trying to learn about them from them. But again, if you have questions, I'm not telling you to not to ask, but at the same time, don't ask too many questions. That may show them that you actually not really know what you're up to or like you don't know what's awaiting for you. Okay, and then um, you will be accepted in dental school. Um, and during dental school, it's a four years um, journey. So I would say that it's good to learn as much as you can because this is the time where you have mentors you have friends, you have a lot of opportunities that you can learn from. Also practice as much as you can through SimLab, seeing more patients, volunteer um, on the weekends, um, in different projects, and just make most of it. And don't forget to enjoy it because it's something that you work too hard to get there. So enjoy it and be proud about it. Then in my dental school, um, oh, here I added some pros and cons about dental schools because I did some um, like residency um, after my graduation and I met a lot of dental students here in Chicago. And I saw some difference between, let's say the dental school that um, I was at in Chicago and the dental school um, that I did my training, specialty training. I compared the dental school to, to, the, to my school in California. And I saw some differences here and there that I can share with you. And also you can put this like um, information or those like uh, answers also in the way when you have your interviews, because they may ask you, why do you want to choose my program um, in compared to other programs? So some dental school may have specialty programs, meaning you are in the dental school, but also there are um, residents, dental residents and other specialty clinic. This is not bad, but sometimes it's not the, the best because that means the patient's cases will be divided among everyone. So if you have a complex case, that case will, will go by a default to a specialty clinic, to the dental residence. So if you want to be a dental student in a dental school that you do a little bit more advanced stuff, then maybe try to focus on dental school that doesn't have specialty program because there's no other people or residents or other clinic that may come and take those cases from you. However, some people want to actually learn from the other programs. They have kind of like a source of, of uh, people who may answer any questions or they can go and shadow what they do. So it depends on what you want to do and what you want to be. Also, the class size. This can vary um, in a huge way between programs. Some programs may have just uh, a small number of students 
and some programs may have a large number of students. Some people may say, okay, if I'm in a large class, that's good. I have more friends, we can support each other, we can learn from each other. Um, some people say, no, I would like to be in a smaller environment. I have to have more access to the faculty, better access to the patient. So you, you really need to know who you are. Uh, so when you apply, you make sure that you are actually applying or at least ranking the program that fits you the, the best. Patient pool. When it comes to patient pool, you want to know where is the school located? what um, type of a population is around the school, because this is mostly what you will see. Is it patients who have um, dental insurances? Is it patients who are young, adult, geriatric? Are you gonna do a lot of removable because maybe the economy in that neighborhood is not high so they cannot afford implants? Uh, so you're gonna be doing mostly like removable. So it depends. Is it a lot of kids in the area? Is it, you, you can kind of um, like search and learn, but honestly, this part, maybe if you don't know anyone inside the school, maybe it's, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. So sometimes we can advise you to, um, get to know some students out there, like try to find them online on Instagram, connect with them, um, do those virtual events that the schools sometimes offer through ADA and the other organization and try to make connections because sometimes the most correct answers will come from people who are there inside that dental school. And faculty support. Again, a lot of people talk about faculty and student ratio. The more students, the less the ratio. Um, but again, this is sometimes not an issue because most of the dental schools will make sure that everyone is getting their questions answered in, in a great time, like time and manner. So I don't, I never heard about dental school that they have issues with the class size uh, compared to the faculty number. Then when I was in my third year in dental school, um, basically in your third and fourth year, we start seeing a lot of patients. So in my third year and fourth year, I started to find myself that um, I love everything about dentistry and um, I'm enjoying everything. However, there's part in dentistry that I enjoy more and I'm all, I always want to learn more about that specific field inside dentistry, which is prosthodontics. So I started to actually think about getting specialty in prosthodontics and started to learn more. I opened my application, I applied, I got an interview really fast. I did it and then I got in. But all that time I was still trying to know that, like to make sure that this is something that I really want to do. And the way I confirmed is, the, is by like, I'm really interested in that part of dentistry and I didn't really, care the other part in dentistry may not be available to me anymore. Meaning when you specialize in dentistry, you may give up an other part of dentistry because it's not part of your specialty. And after spending so many years in the specialty, you may not perform those procedures at the same level as other people who specialize in it or he kept or they kept practicing those procedures. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys know in details about the dental procedures, but I can give a quick example which is I specialized in prosthodontics, which I'll show in the following slides what type of treatments we do. But there is also a procedure in dentistry called root canal. It's when a cavity hits the nerve and we have to remove the nerve and fill the canals. It, by going to a prosthodontics, I know for sure that I'm not gonna be doing uh, root canals or I'm not gonna be doing braces or I'm not gonna be doing uh, or seeing a lot of kids because this, specialty is mainly adults and geriatric. So if you're open about that fact, then you're good. But some people is like, no, I don't wanna be limited. I wanna do everything. Then maybe a specialty is not the best option to go to. But if you are interested and you really want to expand your knowledge and master one area in dentistry really fast at a younger age, then do a specialty, it's worth it. Um, and again, for a specialty, it's always good to maintain a good GPA. It's always maintained to, to have a good class ranking, 
But let me tell you the truth, even if your GPA was not the best, and even if your class ranking is not top 10, you still can get a really good specialty in a really good program. They are a little bit more lenient in the specialties when we compare it to the dental school. And also it's easier to get in the dental specialty than getting in dental school. Because, because remember, you're a dentist, first thing. So you already made it, you're, you are adequate, you're competent, you already went through the hard part of dentistry. Now getting to a specialty, it's something that you're actually doing to yourself, not to the program. Like even in the program, when we do our exams and tests, they advise us to study because this is gonna help us not help them or the faculty. Um, so it's easier to get in. And if you are really interested, then do it. Okay, so um, in dentistry, there used to be nine specialties, but I think at the end of last year, one more specialty was added to the list. So here, if we're gonna start from the left side to the right, we see that one of the specialty is endodontics, which is the root canals. And then there's the pediatric dentistry, which is like mainly seeing kids. Then there's radiology, which is assessing radiographs, reading 3Ds, 3D comb beams and all that. There's oral pathology related to the lesions um, and like the diagnosis and how to treat them. We, or, we also have oral surgery, which, which has all the surgeries happen uh, with teeth extraction, dental implants, um, like resections due to cancer, trauma cases and all the fun stuff. Uh, oral medicine is the newest specialty that was added, added to the list, which is also like related to oral lesions, uh, related to CMJ, to pain. Um, if patient has neural issues and they have some pain from trigeminal neurology or all these things, they can actually control it and try to help. Prosthodontics is restoring teeth and replacing missing teeth. Uh, we have periodontics, which is um, mainly focus about the gingiva, gum surgeries, bone grafting, bone regeneration, dental implants, crown lengthening, and all that. And the tenth uh, specialty is, is dental public health, which is mostly about like epidemics and how to prevent diseases in the population and in the community. So after you become a specialist, so now we're talking about like let's say four years. Um, college and university and you get your bachelor and then you get into dental school then we're talking about four years dental school so now it's a total of eight years and then you decided to become a specialist so let's say specialty program most of it it's from two to three years my specialty was three years so now we're talking about 11 year can you stop there or is, is there anything else you can actually still train afterwards well, you still can do a second residency. And so second residency, sometimes people actually specialize, like have a double specialty. So after they finish one specialty, they actually get enrolled in another specialty and they like to be double specialist. But also there's something else exists and it's called fellowship, exactly like the medical field. So fellowship is something that you want to expand your training and this is still related to your specialty. And this is what I'm actually going to be doing in Harvard uh, for two years, starting this July. That uh, fellowship is mainly in implantology and surgery. So it's going to be focused in surgery, yet we will be restoring using all the principles that I learned in the specialty training. So there is, I'm not sure about all the other specialties, but I can speak really well for the prosthodontics field. There are two types of fellowship. One of them is implantology, which is mainly in implants. And this one can vary from one year to three years. It depends on the program that you're applying to. It depends on how advanced you want to learn. Um, so I know some programs are just one year and some and uh, Harvard the program is two years and there's a program in Loma Linda, California, three years. And each program, they have different requirements. So you really need while you're in dental school or you're in your specialty, if you feel you are interested, start to learn about all these programs earlier on. So you start to see which one matches you. And sometimes it doesn't hurt if you actually go and pay them a visit and see the program in real life and, and talk to the residents. So I actually did that um, in 2019. 
uh, and in 2019, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was like the beginning of my second year in specialty. I actually flew to California and I did a few days internship in Loma Linda um, specialty, uh, like the implantology fellowship. And I knew like it's really good, but after like comparing, you can make decisions if you want to still like consider it as an option or like if you're going to go to a, to a different place uh, based on the state, based on how long is the program, based on how many patients you may see, how many surgeries you will do. So that's actually nice to know because you will still can ad like advance and get more surgical uh, skills, even though you didn't consider a surgical specialty in the first place. So now what's the pros and cons about special specialty program? So I said here class size again, um, even though in the dental specialties, uh, you will see that they usually accept two to three, uh, let's say actually two to five residents each year. But in some programs, they may, they may accept 10 people a year. So if you compare this program to the other programs, we're talking about 20 to 30 residents compared to like another programs that may, that may have a total of six residents in all three years. So uh, in my program at UIC, it's actually a large program. It's one of the largest in the state. And when, yes, and when I, um, applied to it, I was so excited about that fact. But after spending three years, and now I'm trying to consider another training, after spending three years, it was really good. But if I have to do it again, um, for pros maybe, but if I'm continuing my education, I don't wanna keep, stay on the same path. So one of the reason I picked Harvard is it was the smallest class they had compared to the other programs. Um, and that can be good, that can be not the best. It depends on what you're looking for. Um, also surgical experience. So especially when I'm talking about prosthodontics, because I know some pros programs, they have zero surgical experience or really minimal surgical experience, including placing dental implants, extracting the patient's teeth. Uh, but for me to be in process, I really didn't want to quit or give up on extractions or like learning how to place implants or like do bone um, graft in extraction sockets. So this is part of what I like to do too. And I, I, I really want to keep doing it. So I picked a program that actually has a good portion of surgical experience experience offered to the residents. Some programs of the same specialty were not as exposed to the surgical, to surgical procedure as us. So it depends, it, it's really up to you. I have a friend that he doesn't want to do any surgeries. So he went to a program that has zero surgeries. Um, some people love to do surgeries. We, we meet them during the interviews in my specialty program. And it's, it's there, it's available, they can apply to and they will get what they want. Also digital dentistry. Digital dentistry is something that's big and this is where the dental field is moving toward. So it's nice to be in a program that's really easy and fast to get updated and to incorporate all these digital concepts and the softwares and the tools to the program really fast so you don't actually fall behind, especially that you are in a specialty program, which means as a specialist, you should be really up to date. And again, patients pool. You want to be in a program that's easy to see patients and easy to find patients and easy to meet the requirements for graduation. Because believe me, after all these years of training, you don't want to be under that type of stress. Um, in finding patients or like how where you're gonna be very competent in, in your specialty field. Okay, so what type of treatments do, uh, do we do in the specialty? Um, I know maybe some of you maybe, maybe love to hear more about treatments you do in dental school. So basically in dental school, you do anything you want to do. As long as the faculty are also comfortable for you to do it and they will supervise you. So of course you will do all the general dentistry procedures. You still can challenge some advanced cases again, as long as the faculty supports you and agree to supervise you. I did a couple procedures um, in dental school that it's not common to be done by a dental student. Uh, but you still can do it um, as long as you get the support and someone who's comfortable and competent enough to supervise you. Uh, but when it comes to PROS specialty, keep in mind, PROS is really, it has a lot of general dentistry procedures, minus few procedures. But if you look at the photos, 
of course we do a lot of crown props and crowns and of course we do a lot of veneers and bridges and dentures and partials so all that is done also by general dentist and you will do a lot of these as dental students i think the couple um procedures that I added here um, that are not done by a dental student are maybe the lower uh, right side photos, which is um, anything that has um, like a full mouth rehabilitation and reconstructions, whether uh, on natural teeth or on dental implants. So in dental school, um, I know if you are like really um, like um, like curious to learn about full mouth rehabilitation and how to prop the entire mouth and how to take the patient from a collapsed bite to uh, a makeover. Well, that's not gonna happen in dental school. <laughs> and I, I feel like, sorry if I am breaking <laughs> the news too early, that's too advanced. And honestly, there's so much things to learn as a dental student. Sometimes I don't think there's even extra time to learn that advanced in dental school. That's why some people try to learn through through courses or workshops or even like consider training, additional training. But if you look at the lower right photos, you will see that patients lost all the teeth. And those type of patients come to you and they know that they don't have any teeth or they know that they have teeth, but they're not good teeth. They will be taken out. And they come to you and they say, you know what? I don't want to go with something removable. Like I cannot live a day in my life with something removable. And I want to have something fixed by the end of the treatment. Usually, if those type of patients come, um, most likely they will be seen by a specialist or a dentist that have a lot of experience. But as a new grad dentist, I don't think they are competent enough to do it because keep in mind, this type of specialty is three years. So if I graduated from dental school, we're kind of missing out on three years of additional knowledge and actually experience and actually um, hand skills that we learned through the process to kind of know how to restore these patients in a way that also lasts longer. Sometimes we see full mouth rehab that was done by a non-specialist and it looks nice but after two years or three years or even five years everything is failing and collapse well do you do you call this a successful treatment do you call this um, so it depends because when you provide patients treatment you want to also give a predictable treatment and a long outcomes of the treatment you don't want to keep you you don't want to keep redoing the work every few years because things are falling apart um, and it could have been avoided if you actually had additional information or additional knowledge or experience. Um, so, and also the last photo on the right side, we call this all in four. And keep it in mind because the case that I'm gonna show, it's also an all in four case. So those type of cases, patients come to us, they don't have teeth or all the teeth they have are non-restorable. We have to remove them. We place a minimum of four implants and we have a bridge, fix a bridge that we screw it on the implant and the patient cannot remove it. It can only be removed by the dentist if, it, if it's needed. So that's called all in four. And the case that I'm going to present to you is one case that I did in my, my residency here in Chicago. Um, and um, I just finished restoring just right before graduation, which was last week. So this patient is MW, and this is a 58-year-old Polish African. Polish American female that presented uh, to us at UIC. Usually when we see any patients, we have to go over the medical history, exactly like what we do in dental school. So this patient was negative for any medical conditions, any medications or allergies. Patient doesn't smoke, doesn't drink alcohol, no recreational drugs, which is the most important part in the social history when we consider surgeries is smoking because the, the minute patient is smoking, that means they have a slow healing um, they are more prone for infection, um, higher risk of failure for implants. So when the patient doesn't smoke, that's a good thing. And also in prosthodontics, we have something called psychological uh, diagnosis, which is like how the patient uh, interact with us and how, how are the expectations? Are they reasonable and reasonable? So this patient is philosophical, which means um, she is reasonable with her expectation. She follows our instruction. Um, she's motivated to start her treatment. 
usually we we go through a long procedure of comprehensive treatment planning and collecting uh, information and how we fabricate the treatment plan but here i'm just going over um over the process really fast um so here we ask the patient even before we touch the patient like give us exaggerated smile and when the patient does that we start assessing the smile line which is the lip how far it can go high uh, how much teeth it shows does she show the gum and the upper teeth because the more the more the lip goes higher the way we approach the case and the way we treatment plan start to change a little bit uh, slightly different than if the patient doesn't show the gum and also we start to assessing the midline because if the patient's going to lose her teeth and we're starting from the scratch then we want to put everything in the right position so sometimes patients come to us and the midline which is uh, the midline between the two central teeth that's the dental midline is not coincident with the facial midline if you if you draw a midline on the patient's fail, face to get a symmetrical halves if you're removing the teeth, uh, teeth and you're starting from the scratch, then you can make them maybe coincident. And sometimes when you start doing your wax up and teeth setup, maybe you cannot. So at, so at least you start planning and know all these answers before you touch the patient. Then we look inside the patient mouth and we see, uh, we collect all the information, uh, which teeth are do exist, uh, which teeth are missing, what's the condition of the existing teeth, are there root canals, are there cavities, is there open margin. So this patient on the upper arch, she has three teeth um, and two anterior implants and a temporary bridge that's connecting everything. So the teeth that you see in the upper arch is temporary, is made out of acrylic. And when we look at the when, and when we look at the lower um, uh, arch, we see that the patient doesn't have any teeth. This is actually a bridge that made out of acrylic and sitting on four implants. So this is all in four. And this is how the patient presented. She has this old all and four prosthesis and the lower arch, mandibular arch, and she has three existing teeth and two implants and the maxillary arch. We also do straight shots, side shots. Uh, if patient had more teeth, we do all the excursive movement. We tell the patient go to the right, left, to the forward, protrusive. We assess how the occlusion is. So if you look here, um, especially if you pay attention on the lower um, right photo, you will see that um, you will see that one of the implant, if you see the white material around like the gum, this is actually infection. And you will see in the following slides uh, how much is the infection around those implants. So sometimes we still like see taking the photos, um, taking x-rays to, to learn about the implants, about the roots inside the bone. You still can collect a lot of information even without touching the patient. You will know what's, if the teeth or the implants are re, uh, restorable or not by just your uh, examination. So if we look at the two-dimensional panoramic radiographs, we see that, again, three teeth are on the upper with two anterior implants, and you see the four implants in the mandible in the lower jaw. If you look at the right, the most right, and the most left dental implants, uh, you will appreciate the, the amount of bone loss around these implants by this like gray shadowing around the, the implants. And if you look at the upper jaw in the back, you will see that the sinus, uh, I cannot put my arrow, but the sinuses are so low and there's almost no bone. We will see it in the 3D x-ray as well in the following slide. So here are the periapical radiographs and the periapical radiographs shows you the tooth that you see coming from the gum inside the mouth and also shows you the bone and the roots inside the bone. So it shows you basically the entire teeth. We will see that on the left photo and the left radiographs, you see that the teeth are really compromised because this white material that's going inside the root, this is actually root canal and post that's going already in the tooth. So usually when the teeth are that heavily restored and they want to be used again in a new treatment, most, most likely those teeth are not good or restorable because they are too compromised. And if you look at the tooth in the middle, you will also see a circle around the apical um, portion of the root, like a gray uh, area. This is also infection. So we see that the teeth are heavily restored. With that, there's still existing infection. So those always sign that these teeth are non-restorable. And when we look at the front implants, they look good. 
some bone loss, yes, but the surprise is, is that those implants is an old version of implants that we don't use nowadays. It's a one piece implants. Usually the implants are something that we put in the bone and then whatever you see coming as a small tooth, usually this is another component that we screw on the implant. However, those implants, everything you see, it's a one piece. So usually if we're taking, um, if we're taking everything out and trying to start all over from the scratch, you don't wanna have something that's not very common or it's hard to restore with something like a very complex treatment that you're providing to the patient. So in those type of cases, it's better to remove also those implants because it will be hard to try to combine those implants with the new implants that we're gonna place and how we're gonna restore teeth and all these different types of implants. Here is the 3D X-ray, um, the CBCT, and we're going in the cross-sectional from the right to the left. So this area here is the sinuses. This area uh, under the sinus is where she's missing her teeth for so long that she doesn't have any bone. So when she started to have bone, it's really like right here. <laughs> We're not going to place implants in that area. But where um, like we need to place implant, there's almost nothing. Like if we open the bone, if we open the gum, we will see maybe just a layer of bone. And if we try to drill anything inside, we will actually get in the sinus. So in those type of treatment, even some people may say, okay, you know what, let's build bone. Keep in mind, building bone or like sinus lifts, if you hear that term, which is sometimes like they raise this membrane higher and they pack bone here, they are more successful if you start with a good amount of bone. I mean, you don't have to have a lot of bone, but you want to have some bone that has some blood vessels so it can supply the area and the new bone that you're packing and make it mature and real bone. So usually if you don't have bone to start with, it's really hard to build bone or do bony grafts or sinus lift. So what's the solution? Here's also some screenshots of the same CBCT. So you see by number two, the left side, there's no bone. Number three, there's a little bit of bone that, that you still cannot use to place implants. Maybe in this area you can build bone, but if the bone only exists in a narrow small area, not in the region, it's even not possible to build bone just in that area. And then we see where the teeth are. And then as we go to number 10, 11, 13, there is no bone in very inadequate bone height, width, and also length. Also here, like what I did is when I tried to confirm, because when I looked at the x-ray, I really didn't know that this implant is the one piece implant. So before even removing the patient's teeth or anything, even though we know that those teeth are non-restorable, I just removed the provisional around one implant to see what's underneath. And then I learned it's the one, one piece implant. So sometimes it's nice to collect information. But again, if we made the decision from the first time also that we may not restore the implants or keep the implants, then maybe you can and skip this part. The surprise is when we remove the lower bridge, uh, just like I had to remove it, so I take an impression, so I can start setting the new teeth that we're gonna use uh, for her next step in the treatment. Just by me unscrewing the bridge, this implant came with it. This is how much infection, bone loss happened around the implant that I didn't even, we didn't numb the patient either. I just remove it, it came with it. This is how bad the infection is. So in that situation, what we did is, Obviously I didn't put it back, but patient still has to get her bridge back because we're still working on her new teeth. So I had to section and just put a shorter bridge on the three implant existing. But, but we also at this step, um, we still knew that also the right side, the most distal, uh, implant is also need to be taken, but we postpone removing that implant until the day of the surgery. So basically what am I doing during these appointments? It's still comprehensive exam, meaning I'm still obtaining the information I need to make the teeth and the bridge and the prosthesis that I need to use on the day of the surgery. So this patient was interdisciplinary between my clinic, which is prosthodontics and the oral surgery specialty. So Oral surgery usually wait on us to collect all the information, do the impressions, mount and articulate the models, uh, do the wax rims, set up the teeth, merge the teeth to the x-ray. And then after we merge the final position of the teeth to the x-ray, the surgery start planning their implant. So this is what I love about prosthodontics is that 
we do the treatment from A to Z before we touch the patient. And when we get to the Z product, which is the final product of where the teeth will be and the position of the teeth, we take it, we merge it to the X-ray and we go back and we start placing the implant in relation to the final prosthesis. So we know exactly that everything's going in a successful way and in a successful sequence. And it's the rate of complication is so minimized. In most cases, it's almost to zero. Okay, so here I took in the lower left photo, we did wax trim, we get the bite, we ordered the denture teeth, we set up the teeth, we process, I got my dentures. But it doesn't mean that I'm gonna give the dentures to the patient. Actually, I, after I set up the teeth, as you see in the middle photo, the lower, we merged it. Um, and if you look at the upper photo, we merged the white teeth. It's actually the teeth setup that I did, even though the patient still has her teeth that she presented with. So we put, uh, we merged the final setup of the teeth to the 3D X-ray and we started to place the implants. Now I said, patient doesn't have bones. So how are we placing implants? So if you look closely to the uh, x-rays, um, the skeletal x-rays on the upper photo, you will see that the purple implants are actually really long. So what are these implants? These are called zygoma implants. So zygoma implants are a long implants. We can go up to 50 millimeter. And we start in the mouth, okay? Because you want to finish to be in the mouth, right? Patients want some teeth. <laughs> However, those implants, if you don't have enough bone in the maxilla, which we call it very atrophic maxilla, which means there's no bone, we lean the head of the, um, the implant on the bone where just the minimal, almost no bone. However, the implant is so long and we actually stabilize it and make it osteointegrated in the cheekbones, the zygomatic bone. So the maximum number of implants we can place in those type of cases are four. So you cannot have five or six, or at least I've never seen because the amount of bone you have under your zygomatic bone is really minimal to two on each side. Um, so again, this implant travels all the way here and they are the most kind of aggressive dental implants we may use. So we only use it in the cases that we actually don't have other options to do. And after that, sometimes those implants actually cross through the, the sinus. Sometimes they are outside the sinus. It really depends on the anatomy of the patient and how the concavity is here, uh, the, like the maxillary um, sinus wall toward the implant path. And those things are known before we even touch the patient. When we set up the teeth and we place the implant and the x-ray, we see if it's penetrating the sinus or not. Then we get this blue, uh, this not blue, this yellow orange <laughs> fat pad uh, from the cheek and they cover it so this is how like the patient doesn't actually feel the metal it's still covered by a fat pad um, and then they suture it and this is the day like on the day of the surgery usually it starts at 8 30 and this type of surgery happens while the patient is actually asleep under ga anesthesia the day starts around 8.39, oral surgery come to our office, um, the surgical suite, and they extract all the teeth, they flood, they place the implant, they suture like what we see in the middle lower photo. And after they suture, they wake up the patient and they send the patient to us. And I also included the lower arch because I said on the day of the surgery, we're also going to remove the other implant failing, the other failing implant on the other side. So after that, after they finish with this phase, they wake up the patient, send it to us. And on the same day of the surgery, we have to place implant on those implants. Sorry, we have to place teeth on those implants. And those teeth are not final teeth. They are temporary teeth. They will be on the implant for for a month until the implants are really healed and osteointegrated in the bone. And then they come back and we start doing um, impression for the final, for the final teeth. Now, some commercials um, say teeth in one day, right? Maybe, I don't know if you guys hear it, but as you go through dental school, you will even hear it more. And if you consider specialty, then you're going to hear it every week. So teeth in a day. Well, there is no teeth in a day. I mean, when the patient comes to us, we extract the teeth, place implant, give them fixed teeth on the implant. Yes, this is teeth in a day, but we cannot mislead the patients. Those teeth are not final teeth. Those teeth are temporary teeth. Patients still have to come back in a few months after the healing is done. And then we have to take the patients to the um, 
to the final teeth. So it's a, so when the patient say, can I have teeth in a day? I said, yes, but yes and no. So yes, you will, but no, you still have to come see us in four months to continue with the dental care. Okay, and then she woke up, she comes to me, I had the denture. So if you see the denture on the lower left photo, you will see the flanges are cut in because now I only took the teeth portion from the denture, made holes and I screw it on the implants. Like we pick it up, we screw it on the implants. So the upper teeth right now, the patient cannot remove it. And there's nothing covering the patient's palate. It's just like a bridge sitting on, um, on her upper implants, exactly like how she presented with this bridge. This bridge was kind of like a denture, but then they cut all the flanges and all everything and they cut the teeth portion. This, so this is what we did on the upper. However, on the lower arch, because patients only now have two implants, you cannot do something fixed on two implants. So actually the denture that we did, I picked up the locators, the two implants, locators in the denture, and now she snaps it on the implant. So it's still better than having just a complete denture because it's more retentive, more stable. But again, when we compare it to all and four with something totally fixed, this, this comes like um, not the first choice that patients love to have, but it's, a, it's an option. It's a good option to have if the fixed option is not available. So here was on the day of the surgery. Patient came in the morning and she looked like the left side. She has some teeth on the upper and her failing bridge on the lower. And at the end of the day, she had teeth in a day, uh, but not the final teeth. She had a fixed bridge on the upper and the uh, over denture on the lower. And we call this interim phase. Now the good... Um, the good part about this treatment is you don't see the patient every day or every week because after this surgery, you really cannot touch the teeth that you put on the implant until the implants are fully healed. So we cannot touch the patient up to four months. So patients after this day, even though they have a long day with us, especially that we are residents, we take even longer than if we are practicing outside. But after that day, patient is really on a good break from us for almost three to four months and then they come back for the final. And then after six, month, which is not the case in this case because of the pandemic and the patient willingness to, the willingness to come back, it took more than a year, which was fine because more time for the implant to heal. Patient was in a stable point. I don't see anything, but usually if it takes more than a year, we start worrying about complication because those bridges are not the strongest. We want the patient to come back and go to the final. So if you look at the final, this bridge is made out of zirconia, monolithic zirconia with layered ceramics. So it's more beautiful. It's way stronger. It's the final prosthesis, better aesthetic. So we deliver that to the patients and on the bottom, we still give her an overdenture because patients still like saving a little bit more money to have the all in four. And speaking of money, maybe you wonder how much that type of treatment may cost. So the all in four, including the zygoma implants in a residency program, which is cheaper than outside specialists, it's around 23 to 25,000. So it's totally different than the dental school. I think in dental school, the most expensive treatment plan I ever gave to a patient was around three to 4,000. At uh, the specialty program, we present treatment plan that is like 47,000, 40,000, 35,000. So it's it was a learning care for us to learn how to present such a case with that much um, cost that comes with the case. And this is the panoramic. This is how they look. You can see how those long implants travel by the sinus to the cheekbone. Now you see this very white bridge because monolithic zirconia is a material that actually shows up on the x-ray. So you see that white long bridge. But look at the lower arch because I think I get really excited when I saw how much bone her body built where in the side that we removed the implant and she had infection. So let's go back because I really think it's really exciting and fun how the body can heal. So if you look at this x-ray, do you see all the gray around the implants? If you go back um, to the final, her body built the implant actually to the level where the front implants are there. So I think this is very um, exciting. <laughs> And that's the end of the case at my presentation. I hope that you guys learned something um, from the presentation and I'm really open to hear any comments you have or any questions you wanna share. Thank you.
Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Sean. We really appreciate that presentation and the case that you presented, just uh, giving us a lot of information about prosthodontics. Let me see questions. I guess we'll start us off with, um, earlier you talked about, um, you know, how the implant had to go in the zygomatic. Is yeah. You said that it's only when there's only like a little bit of bone. Is that something that you rarely do? Is that a very common thing that you, that case in particular? So the zygomatic mostly if patient doesn't have any bone or in the beginning, this treatment started with patient who had cancer or they had trauma and they had to resect a lot of bone and then they started to get the aid from the zygomatic. And when they used it, it turned they saw that it's really successful and everything is going well. And then they said, you know what? Let's also try to use it on people who don't have cancer, but they just don't have bone and it will help. And then they did it and it turned out that it's actually a good treatment option to have. Um, so at UIC or even in general, most of people who place those type of implants are actually oral surgery, not pros, not GPs, not any other, even not periodontics, even though they specialize in dental implants. Um, so usually oral surgeries, as of now, I only know two prosthodontists in the entire United States that they place stegomatic implant. Maybe there's more, but I don't know. But in general, even not every oral surgery surgeon uh, plays those type of implants because they are additional training. So I know at UIC, we were lucky that the oral surgery team are um, trained to place those implants. But my friends in the other PROS programs in different states, uh, they, they don't have that option. So it depends on where you are. It depends on who's the surgeon around you and if they are willing to do this type of treatment or not. Thank you very much. And I do see another question here. This person asks, uh, what factors should I consider when choosing which dental school to go to if I want to uh, specialize afterwards? If you want to specialize um, afterwards, maybe try to get, um, maybe try really hard to get accepted in the school that has the program that you want to specialize at. But I think this is too early to know as a pre-dental student. But let's say, um, so in, I'm from Chicago, right? Like I came here, settled down long time ago. In Chicago, they only had one school that has specialty program. So the option for me, I didn't have so many options to get distracted and I cannot make a decision. Like I, I didn't go through this experience, but I also was lucky enough that I, the program in my home state actually is an advanced program. It has a lot of uh, good reputation. Um, it's a, an older program. Um, so, it, so I knew like if I'm gonna specialize, maybe I want to be in that program. If you know, a good program maybe by following residents on Instagram, you see cases, uh, you're inspired by um, someone that you know or like you watch lectures for some speakers and you want to be like that speaker. Then if you know which program you want, you will make it easier on you by actually trying to get to that dental school. Yet, let's say you don't know, that's totally fine because no matter which dental school you go to, it's not gonna affect much. Uh, like which specialty usually if you are interested you still have four years of dental school to actually learn about specialty programs maybe um, go visit them let's say you while you're in dental school you finally knew which specialty program you want to go to I would recommend you to go do internship as dental student because you are introducing yourself to them and you are making them get to know you and then by the time you do your internship and then the cycle opens and you apply and you send an email saying, you know what, I came and I know and I'm interested and you show your interest, most likely you will get in. Because those type of specialty, they want students who are really knowing that they want to do this specialty and they're sure that they want the program because at the end of the day, none of the program wants any of the resident to drop out. This is like a loss for the program. Uh, you keep a, an empty chair um, based on the ratio of the patients to the, like it, it's, a, it's a whole process. So they want something that they know for sure they, they will stay there. So if you show your interest, you're in. Thank you very much. And I see another question that says, do you recommend starting a specialty right after dental school if you're interested in one or to practice dentistry first, then pursue a specialty? It depends. 
um, for me, it, honestly, like those those questions, they can be very controversial. Like I can give you two answers, two opposite answers, and I can defend each answer in a way to make you convinced that this is the correct answer. So it depends. Let's say you want to really be one of my classmates applied to radiology. So if you're going to be in radiology, maybe don't go practice because at the end of the day, you will be just in front of the computer reading and assessing and writing reports about radiographs. But you may say, well, uh, maybe I'm not talking about radiology. Maybe I'm talking about endodontics or even prosthodontics. It depends. So in my opinion, it's easier to finish school and go to dental specialty because you're still in that mood of studying and being a student. Sometimes if you go to the world, to the real world, it will be hard to come back. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen because in my program, we have most of it actually are dental students who graduated, but there's also a good percentage of people who had experience in dentistry for three to six years. Um, sometimes uh, dentists come back because like they want to go practice, make money, actually pay for the program from their own money, not taking additional loan. Um, so they practice more, They or maybe they secure their family, or their kids are so young, they wait until they get older. It depends on the situation. Let's say you are free, you don't have babies, or like you don't have um, like financial problems or anything, and you have the ability to go from dental schools to specialty, I think do it, because you're still, again, in the mood to, to, to keep studying. That's one thing. Second thing, the earlier that you can be a specialist, the more that you can help your patients because the more you do your general dentistry there's a lot of general dentists but if you look at the number of specialists there's not a lot of specialist numbers like it's not a huge number so i think um, it will be faster for you to be more competent faster to you to give advanced treatment and then your specialist at a younger age you can actually start doing more work advanced work and actually make maybe make more money um, as you keep going so it depends on how you think about it for me I always wanted to to understand dentistry more um, and have more knowledge and experience before I start treating patients because I sometimes you know how you treat patients and then after you finish the treatment you say you know what only if I knew that I would have done it um, I it happens at any age no matter who you are or like what um training you had but I like that moment to happen less in my life <laughs> all right thank you and this is just a question that we ask um, all our guests that we have on the virtual shadowing sessions if you could go back in time to maybe when you were a pre-dental student or you know before you know thinking of specializing is there any advice that you would give to your younger self like kind of thinking back from where you are now Hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. I would say maybe, okay, I would, the only maybe advice, because in most of the time I tried to really be a good student. <laughs> Um, and I came from a family where like we study a lot, me and my sisters and all that, but maybe I took things more seriously than it should have been. Um, I would say to my, to like, to my younger self or like to anyone who's watching is that the process is a long process. We all agree. So many years, so many steps, but I don't want you to think it's a hard process or an impossible process. Actually, the minute that you wake up one day and you have this idea in your mind, it means that you are capable of achieving this idea or else it wouldn't cross your mind. That's psychology, actually. <laughs> so just trust yourself. Maybe I should have trusted myself better because I think I was trust. The younger I was, the more stressed I was. And then as I got older, I, I changed and I grew and I started to think in a different way. But if you started working on your dental journey, then you will get there. So don't, don't, don't be over like thinking or um, you lose like on your real, like on your um, balancing life or enjoying life. Just like enjoy the process. You will get there. If I did it, you will do it. Um, and then focus on what you're doing. Um, just try your best every time. And then it will be fine. It will work out. You'll get there. 
So don't don't overthink, don't stress over the process. Thank you so much for that. That's wonderful advice. And with everything, uh, just thank you again, Dr. Deshaun. We really appreciate your time, your presentation, and answering the questions that the viewers had. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us. And the quiz will be posted soon. And give a round of applause to Dr. Deshaun for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. It was really fun to share everything I said. Thank you so much. All right, guys. See you at the next session. Okay, I have ended. All right.